this episode of the ADF Architecture TV channel and today in this episode we're going to continue with our architectural presentations on not design and architecture and development of ADF applications but the pre-planning phase and we're specifically going to talk about developer PCs or the minimum hardware and setup of JDeveloper that you will require. So we know from the JDeveloper documentation pages, specifically the installing JDev guide, that there is minimum hardware requirement spelled out. But remember from Oracle's perspective, we want to make that minimum as low as possible so we can't exclude any customers, or we don't exclude any customers. But from your perspective, that minimum isn't really useful because what you need to think about is making sure that your developers have the right hardware for being productive during your um, project. So in this episode, let's talk a little bit more about realistic hardware configurations for developers and also talk about the JDeveloper installation itself and what some things you need to consider are. So considering the real JDeveloper minimum hardware requirements to, in order to make your developers productive, you need to understand that JDeveloper has two characteristics. Number one, it is I.O. intensive, i.e. its uh, input-output to the disk is something that it's doing all the time. And the other thing is it has a large memory requirement. So with those two things in mind, that gives you an idea of what things that you should provision in your developer's PCs. You should provide very fast hard disks, so we're talking like 7200 RPM hard disks, or ideally solid state disks or SDDs. These really will make a big difference to your developer's productivity because they're continuously rebuilding code and that requires a lot of I.O. on the file system. Personally, I have a small MacBook Pro uh, 11 and it has a small SSD on it. And even though it has a very low power CPU, that SSD makes it faster than my desktop computer. Okay, so you will find that throwing an SSD at the developer will make a big difference. The other thing that JDeveloper has, and I already mentioned, is its memory requirements. Now we say two or three gigas memory, uh, minimum requirement, but we really do recommend four to be realistic. Now you might actually want to go more than that, eight or 16, because what you can start doing once you've got even more memory is creating virtual machines, and in those virtual machines having lots of different JDeveloper's configured. But four gigabytes is my realistic uh, minimum, and it's something that you will notice if you tend to drop below that, you'll start to notice that it becomes, JDeveloper that is, it starts to become a little bit un, uh, unresponsive as it's pushing things to disk and bringing it out again. The other thing about JDeveloper is that it's made up of lots of little windows, and the developer's constantly working with those little windows in order to support their main coding effort. Now, if you have a very small display, you'll find that the developer is constantly sh shutting windows down and opening them, shutting them down and rearranging them. And the flip side of this is if you give them a large display, say a 24 inch monitor, then their productivity goes up because they're not constantly rearranging these windows. Just to give a personal anecdote again, now I have um, some last de large desktop machines with large monitors, but I also use this small MacBook Pro 11 inch. And that little screen, I notice when I'm presenting and teaching JDeveloper, and I'm constantly rearranging those windows, I feel quite fatigued at the end of it. So this gives evidence about why you want to um, provide as much screen real estate for your developers as possible. Finally, CPU. While you do need a reasonable CPU, and, and when this was, uh, episode was recorded, that's an i5 dual-core CPU, um, the CPU doesn't seem to make a lot of difference. So as you go up to bigger and faster CPUs, of course you do get a speed benefit, but it doesn't seem to make JDeveloper run incredibly fast. Um, generally the sweet point is about an i5, an Intel i5 chip and JDeveloper runs fine. Uh, again, my little MacBook Pro, um, it only has an i5 Ducor um, mobile CPU in it and it, it never really struggles. Um, my bigger machine, which is an i7 quad-core machine, well, it struggles and it's got more CPU power, but the reason it struggles is it has a 7200 RPM hard drive in it, not an SSD disk. So again, remember those um, hard drives, the input output, the faster you can make that on your developers PCs and laptops, the better it will be. Remember the memory, think about screen real estate and that's probably going to give your developers a productive machine to work with. Now there is something, regardless of the amount of hardware that you throw at the problem, that will affect JDeveloper speed and that is virus scanners. 
Now, personally, when I, once, a long time ago, I was a consultant at different sites, depending on the different virus scanners installed at those uh, enterprises, sometimes JDeveloper would run fine, and other times, oh my goodness, my whole day was just waiting for a click, and then another click. And after a lot of investigation, discovered that the virus scanners on the machines sometimes were just being totally overzealous in scanning what JDeveloper was doing. Why? Well, you'd know that JDeveloper is obviously written on top of Java, and more recently, Java's had a lot of security vulnerabilities. The issue is a lot of the virus scanners now scan all the Java code, and some of them don't do it particularly efficiently. A number of years ago, I experienced that McAfee virus scanner, what it was doing was every time a jar file, now remember JDeveloper is written on top of Java, it's made out of numerous jar files, every time even a jar file was accessed, not opened, not run, but even just accessed, the virus scanner would come along and try to rescan that jar. Now if those jars are compressed, what the virus scanner has to do is uncompress them, scan the whole jar, and then report back that everything's okay. If the virus scanner, or I should say JDeveloper, is accessing 10 or 20 jars at one go, you can imagine the amount of work that's going on and the amount of CPU resources that's taking, the amount of I.O. resources that's taking, and JDeveloper just runs poorly. So what I'm going to recommend here is not, not have virus scanners, but what I do need to recommend is don't blindly sit there and think that, well, it's a blanket policy for virus scanners on and off you may need to put some exemptions into your virus scanners to make sure that your developers, even though you've just thrown potentially $2,000 to $5,000 worth of hardware at them, that they aren't being incredibly slowed down by the virus scanner that you've got at your organization. Now, I know that's going to be a bit of a challenge because at some organizations, if you go, oh, well, we need some exemptions put in our virus scanners, and then you realize you've got to go and submit an issue or, or go and talk to some security guys who may not even work in your building or even in your country to convince them that you need an exclusion from the very, very important security uh, policies that they have at that organization, it can become a huge bureaucratic fight. Luckily, not my problem anymore. I work for Oracle. So, um, but for you, this might be an issue and just be aware of it. It may be a battle that you need to go through. And again, it will affect your de developer's productivity if the virus scanner that you have has a problem. Little hint there, remember it might not be a problem at the moment. There's nothing to say the next version of the virus scanner might not introduce a problem. So you might wanna think about getting those exemptions in place early on, even if it isn't an issue at this stage. Fight the good fight. So we've covered the basics of the minimum hardware requirements for JDeveloper. But let's talk about a little bit of an extension now about once you've installed JDeveloper onto your developer PCs. So what I really want to talk about here is uh, JDeveloper standards. And specifically notice I'm saying JDeveloper here, as in referring to the IDE, rather than talking about standards for ADF application development, which has got to do with the design time and runtime framework. Now with the JDeveloper standards, or how you set up JDeveloper on your machines, assuming you have more than one developer, and that's going to be most of us, you really do need to standardize the installation of JDeveloper on those machines. Why? Because the developer has the opportunity to install JDeveloper anywhere on their machine. So let's say it's Windows, any directory on Windows, so on and so forth. And where we were just talking about, as example, virus scanners and putting exemptions in place, as example, those exemptions, well, they need to know where JDeveloper is located on the machine. So if you put a corporate-wide exemption in place in your virus scanner, but each developer has JDeveloper installed in a different location, guess what's going to happen? Those exemptions are going to be ineffective. That's not the only example where knowing where JDeveloper is installed into a standard place is important. Later on, you might create some build scripts that regardless of where the build script's called on different developers' PCs or even on application servers, uh, I should say continuous integration servers for building your application, again, you might want to standardize the location of where JDeveloper is installed. So you can start to see this sort of stuff is uh, uh, definitely important. In terms of the JDeveloper that you install on the developer PCs, you know that you download the JDeveloper executables from Oracle's OTN website. Now, generally speaking, Oracle, we keep all the executables available, but over time, we do remove some of those executables, and over a long time, though you should be able to retrieve some of these executables or the downloads for JDeveloper from Oracle support, 
in in time they disappear they get lost you know if you go back numerous years we don't have all the software in history so it's well worth from your perspective when you download or your developers are downloading these zips and the install files that you keep a copy of all the different versions on some safe location Second benefit, you're not continuously downloading our massive install files, but it's just this future-proofing exercise of, oh, we've still got an application that's running on version seven. We really need that ex uh, to go and install JDeveloper. Uh, has anyone got it on installed on their machines? Anybody got the install files? No? Uh, let's call, Ar oh, Oracle doesn't have it. Oh, what do we do? So this is why this is a recommendation. In addition with the JDeveloper versions that you download, standardize for your developers on the edition. Now we have different editions, I should say, the Java edition, the Studio edition, and so on. In addition, standardize on the extensions that the developer installs, and also standardize on the patches. Now, I must admit, I haven't necessarily hit an issue with that, recommend, that set of recommendations recently, but in the good old days when I was an Oracle Forms programmer, I remember being at, at, at developer sites, or I should say customer sites that had lots of developers, and there were Forms developers working with, let's say, Forms 4.5, and what they didn't have was a standardized development environment. One had Forms 4.5, vanilla version, and another one had Forms 4.5 with patch 3. And the code eventually once it was fixed by these two different developers and moved up to a test or production environment didn't work and nobody could work out why. Why would the code maybe work on one guy's machine but not on another guy's machine and why it got to test and prod and they started to realize the developers hadn't been keeping all their machines and all the patches in line. So you need to think about this with your JDeveloper developer installations as well. You've got to create a standardized footprint for all your developers so they're not chasing bugs and issues just because somebody has a patch or an extension or a different version of an extension installed. Now a little caveat to that though is while this episode is being recorded is that we actually have multiple of versions or branches of JDeveloper that you can download at this stage. We have 11GR1, 11GR2, and very soon we're gonna have the 12C releases. Now it's quite possible that you may be using, or one developer might be using multiple releases of that software at the same time. As example, at the moment while I'm recording this episode, ADF Mobile is available on 11GR2, but a lot of customers are using that, plus 11GR1 for their main enterprise ADF applications. So the little thing here is you may not have to standardize on one version of JDeveloper on each machine, you might need to standardize on multiple versions of JDeveloper on the same machine. Now there's a little post edit here I've just inserted after recording the presentation and it only came to me after recording this episode is that, okay, not only standardize your JDeveloper versions, but you need to keep track of for your applications which JDeveloper version that they're using. And you go, well, won't it be obvious because you've currently got the JDeveloper installed on your developer PCs. But when you develop multiple ADF applications, remember that your developers tend to keep up with the most recent application and the most recent version of JDeveloper. And you only have to go back two or three or four applications and you potentially haven't migrated those applications up JDeveloper versions yet. Now, if um, in Oracle's terms, we've released numerous 11GR1 releases, so 11, uh, more recently, 11.1.1, 11.1.2, 11.1.3, 4, 5, 6, 7. How do you, when you're going back to versions of JDeveloper, sorry, going back to versions of AF applications, how do you know you've got the right version of JDeveloper to match that? So somewhere you're going to have to record, hey, that application, it's been migrated or it was released on version 11.1.1.6.0 of JDeveloper, as example. And you need to record that so later on when a developer comes back and has to fix a bug or put in a patch, that they know which JDeveloper goes along with that specific um, ADF application. So taking a step back, I mentioned that with your JDeveloper installation, specifically where it's located on your developer PCs, this should be standardized. And I mentioned that the reason to do this is virus scanner exemptions, so they know which directories not to scan in terms of where JDeveloper is installed. And I also mentioned build scripts. A couple of other things you need to keep in mind though is for example with build scripts is that well eventually you may be well for starters you may be building your applications on a Windows PC on a developer's PC right 
So your JDeveloper um, code uh, locations and the JDeveloper installation directory, right, we'll assume that they're Windows paths. But later on, that code and that JDeveloper may move to a continuous integration server, and maybe that's not going to be a Windows machine. Maybe that's going to be a Linux machine, a, uh, a, a, I should say an Oracle uh, unbreakable Linux machine. So those standard locations, though, you still got to think a little bit about well, some of the issues about moving the code and the build scripts between operating systems. So you again need to think a little bit here about standardizing your installation and JDeveloper installation directories and the build scripts such that you can easily transport this infrastructure between operating systems. Okay, so a little clue there. Another thing to consider is that we mentioned that developers may need to have multiple versions of JDeveloper installed. Now, when you install JDeveloper, the typical JDeveloper installer says just throw everything under one subdirectory called middleware. Now, when you've got multiple versions of JDeveloper installed, this is not the right strategy to take. You cannot install multiple versions of JDeveloper all under the same middleware directory. It won't work. So what you need to do is create subdirectories up front for the different versions of JDeveloper. And as it says here on the slide, you might want, for example, a subdirectory like on a Windows machine, C drive, Oracle, JDeveloper, 11.11.160, and C drive, Oracle, JDeveloper, 11.11.20, and so on and so forth. Creating multiple different standard installations of JDeveloper on your machine and pegged to a version number. Further to that, we've mentioned that JDeveloper um, um, needs a standard install directory, but you might also know that JDeveloper behind the scenes, as example on a Windows machine, stores a system directory under C drive, users and documents. Well, actually it depends on which version of Windows, but the later ones are C drive, users and documents, um, your particular username, and some other directory structure like application data and then um, JDeveloper system. Now again, depending on your, uh, your organization setup of those machines, um, that uh, location might move around, but you need to understand that you really need to standardize that location as well. Why? Because the virus scanner, again, will attempt to scan that particular directory, so you need to understand where that is so you can put the right exemptions in place. In terms of the JDeveloper installation, there are some other things that you need to document and standardize on. The first one is that there are two configuration files that are fairly important to JDeveloper. That is rde.conf and jdev.conf. Now these have lots of different settings in them such as the JVM heap size that the JDeveloper IDE is actually starting up with. Again, if you're going to need these to be changed or modified on each developer's PCs, document this and tell your developers how to actually solve that problem themselves. In addition, if the developer downloads or needs to download any extensions, and this is typically done via the Tools uh, Preferences Updates option or in the later versions of JDeveloper, it's the Help Check for Updates options, you need to document specifically what extensions are required and what versions are required. It's also worthwhile going to our, um, our web pages where these extensions can be manually downloaded. And just like downloading the JDeveloper installation files, you should also download these extensions and keep them for future uh, reference in case you need to go, uh, go backwards as such. In addition, the JDeveloper uh, integrated web logic server. Now, typically, this uh, once you install JDeveloper and run the integrated WebLogic server the first time, JDeveloper will set it all up very much in a vanilla fashion. But your application or applications may need different configurations on that integrated WebLogic server to run. So, for instance, if you're using Jindy data sources, um, you may need that the developer installs those data sources such that the application can make use of those. Now, you can definitely document those and you should document what each application requires in terms of the external resources on the integrated WebLogic server and elsewhere. But you can also provide WebLogic server scripts or WST scripts in order the developers just to run those and it will be created for them instantaneously. In addition, in talking about database, uh, uh, database configurations, recognize that in the JDeveloper IDE, the developer will be connecting to all sorts of development time resources. They will be connecting poten uh, potentially to a database 
in order to allow their application to get data at runtime. They will be connecting to, say, change control systems such as Subversion or Git or JITS, depending on how you want to pronounce it. And they will be connecting to eventually dev, test, and maybe production application servers. Now, you could allow your developers to go and configure all those themselves, or again, you could standardize all of those and just give the developers all the settings that they require. Now at this point, it's starting to sound like, oh, we've got a lot of thing, different things here to document and particularly for the developer when setting up a new machine to configure. Well, there is a simple solution to this and this goes back to one of my earlier suggestions or recommendations where kind of the, again, the real minimum memory requirement for JDeveloper is four gig. But if you give the developer's PCs 8 gig, 16 gig or whatever, what you can start to do is just allowing the developers to run virtual machines with JDeveloper installed. Now, what that allows you to do is give them pre-configured pre virtual machines with JDeveloper already pre-configured for development rather than having to go and set this up themselves. Now, arguably at some organizations, they want to do that through their standard operating environment for developers, but that really is too slow a process because you've got to get administrators involved in that process. Why not let your developers maintain their own virtual machines, their own uh, VM clients with the pre-configured settings, keep those for posterity, okay, so even like the older versions of JDeveloper that you may need to, re, uh, to maintain for older applications, have them all pre-configured and all that the developer needs to do when working on different applications is just pick the right VM and starting running it. So there very quickly today we've talked about the real minimum hardware requirements for JDeveloper and we've talked about the some standards and how to install JDeveloper in order to make I guess what we call a standard ADF development environments. These are all little tips that most organizations actually realize after they've been uh, working with JDeveloper for a little while but now you've got a general idea that this is stuff that you can plan for and get in place quite early on in your projects, your ADF projects particularly when developers are there waiting for requirements to come in, they can go and set up all this infrastructure and set up standard operating or standard development environments as a first port of call, uh, first port of call, I should say. You know, and, and this will assist your overall productivity and really it just shows you you've really got your act together as a development team. So thanks very much for joining us on this ADF Architecture TV episode. Um, again, on the screen here, you'll see our, uh, a link to how to subscribe to this channel. And we very much hope that you'll be able to join us for the next episode, which will be published very soon.